When I first started in the wig business, the hair alone could be up to $175 an ounce. Let's just say there was more money in hair than heroin. My stock of hair right now is probably worth over a million dollars. My name is Nicholas Piazza and I'm a wig maker, hairstylist, wig designer. I started doing wigs almost from the beginning of my career. This is my 50th year actually. These are some uh, covers that I'd done for some beauty magazine. I used two pounds of hair to create this style. I worked for the Kenneth Beauty Salon, which was at that time world renowned. All the celebrities, all the movie stars, including people like Jacqueline Onassis and Marilyn Monroe were clients there. I opened my own salon on the Upper East Side. I was there from 1985 until 2010, and I moved into the salon I'm in today at Gloria One. Did you wash this wig? No, I didn't. Okay, let me cut it and then wash it. So it takes about five or six weeks to make a wig. The job of crocheting the hair is called ventilating. The ventilating needles come in different sizes. So if we're doing very fine work, they'll use a, a needle that only takes one or two hairs in each knot. And if we're using a, a heavy wig, we might have a needle that takes up to 10 hairs in each knot. Sometimes the more delicate wigs actually take longer than the very thick ones. At one time there was the synthetic wig boom and everybody had a synthetic wig. And now people seem to be much more interested in, in the quality and they're willing to spend the money for it. My custom wigs range from $38.50 up to $5,000. You know, and I've made wigs for films that I've had to charge more than that for because I had to do them in a hurry and pay through the nose to get it done. My clients are a variety of people. It's the kind of thing where you get a lot of satisfaction when you have clients that are undergoing medical treatments. Sometimes it, it actually held them back from getting their medical treatments if they told that they were going to have hair loss. And then once they got the wig and they saw that they looked as good or in many cases even better than they looked before, they go into their treatments with a, a lot better attitude. I don't know what sets me apart. I'm, I care about what I do, and also I know I'm good at it. And when you're good at something, you enjoy doing it. I see color as a form of communication. I feel like it tells a story. When I look at colors like in a painting, I think automatically, can I put that on a head? My name is Daniel Moon and I'm a hair colorist. I first started getting into hair when I was in the Marine Corps. I barbered myself and other friends. I was granted permission to exit the Marine Corps to go to hair school. Being so restricted in the military, I think uh, getting out of it, there were no limits. Restriction was enforced on me, so when it came to creating, I had a vow that I'd never restrict myself from doing something that felt like I wanted to do and somehow came up with this magic way of coloring hair. So freehand hair coloring is looking at the head as a canvas whether it's short hair or long hair, being able to just paint on it as if it was a sculpture. I find inspiration everywhere. I look to the art world. I look to the magazine world. I look in books. I look where people don't think about looking. When I'm choosing colors and designs, I imagine like a checkerboard. This purple's here, this thread is here. Can I connect this color to that color? I'm looking at it from every angle, top, bottom, left, right, and then just playing with those different kind of shapes. I don't think about being different from other hairstylists. I create work that is different for me. It's different from my last piece. I think people dye their hair to have fun, to create a persona that's fun to live in did some big color changes and had some great collaborations with Madonna, Katy Perry, 
Nicole Richie, and Zoe Kravitz. The work that I create is temporary, and that is a romantic thing. Because it fades away, hair grows out, I can spend three hours, six hours on a piece, and then it can walk out the door and then it's never seen again. I like that it's an art form that washes away. I like to just continue on creating and just making something that I've never seen before. When I lived in Queens, I went to the beauty parlor every two weeks. I still do it here in this independent living community. It's the same routine. This routine is my life. I have been used to it ever since I came to America. Look, I'm 91 years old and I can't stop the aging process, but I try to remedy whatever I can. If you want to call it a beauty routine, see, I don't. I call it just taking care of yourself. I do it as part of my living. I don't think I feel beautiful. I feel like I'm Thelma. Change is hard. Change is hard at any age. But being a senior and leaving your home and leaving familiar faces and starting new, routine's important. So if they're in the habit of getting their hair done on a Friday at one o'clock, they still want Friday at one o'clock. I'm Renee Carpinito. I'm the salon coordinator and hairstylist at Riverwalk Salon. I've been here for 14 years. And working in a residence like this, it does give you enjoyment. Being with them, it makes them feel good because that's what they're supposed to be doing. They've been through it all, doing their hair, making them pretty and making them feel good. You also help them get through their day a little easier. I was born in 1927. I was a teenager during the Holocaust in France. There were days when you couldn't take a bath because there was nothing. But during the war, I had one lipstick and I remember it was called Rouge Baiser, which means red kiss. Lipstick made me feel beautiful. So it's important to me to keep myself clean and to keep myself looking the best I can. We came to this country after the war in 1947. I met my husband. I was married 65 years. After my husband died, I felt very lonely and I was in terrible shape when I came here. But the beauty salon is downstairs on the lower floor. Morning. I go to the beauty parlor every two weeks. It's an intimate place. I talk to people. You feel very good going there. I know that I'll come out and I'll look decent. Two years ago, my husband fell and died. I never thought that this would happen to me. At the beginning, I froze, and I said, who am I? Always dressed, see? This is the way my family was. We always dressed. This is my life today. It cannot be what it was. I have to maintain who I am. I love clothes. My hair is the same as it was when I was 20. It's very simple, and I don't want to lose myself. So far, I have not. 
Thumb has been here a little while. Good morning. She's very sharp. She's very into fashion. Thelma has her style. She knows what she likes. And not too short down okay. here. And I do what she likes week after week. She shares a lot of stories and she goes out often and you know, she's just living life and enjoying life. I feel like coming here gives me the opportunity to have 95 grandmothers. It's a very comfortable place to be. They're getting older and their life is getting a little harder. So when you're the one that makes their day better, that gives you so much more fulfillment. On the internet the other day, I found an animal that looks like something quite familiar. They've tried to block the road, but outside of the road, one share. Turns out, this fluffy looking caterpillar that looks super soft is actually super poisonous. So I called Dr. Wagner. He's an entomologist up at UConn. My specialty is Lepidoptera, which is the study of butterflies and moths. This caterpillar, it has a few names. Well, it's Megalopygia percularis. Most people call this animal the puss caterpillar, except in the south where many people call it the asp. These caterpillars are distinct because they're covered in what looks like long, soft hair. Only mammals have true hair, and then what we find on insects are really derived scales. Underneath those, it's where the poison spines are. They're maybe a little bit like a hypodermic needle. When you pet the caterpillar, it's quite a wallop. I think of all the caterpillars that sting, the asps may have the most painful and most toxic sting. That poison can cause headaches, swelling, nausea, blisters, even difficulty breathing. And in case you were thinking that these guys probably live deep in some jungle, you would be wrong. They're found mostly south of the Mason-Dixon line. So here's a new adage to help you remember. If it looks like Trump's hair, you better beware. <laughs>